Welcome back. Block TV here at the first ever Ethereal Summit in Tel Aviv, Israel. Very exciting times. Very exciting times for me as I'm sitting with Tal Kohl, the um, uh, co-founder at Orbs. This is the second time actually I get the chance to sit with one of the most prolific, I would say, creators, um, uh, programmers in the sphere, as we met, obviously, in Consensus in New York in May. Uh, Tal, great to have you with us. Great to be here. Also super proud that Tel Aviv is hosting Ethereum. It, incredibly so, right? Insane. I know. <laughs> I never thought it would happen. But and here we go. Very nice to see this. Tal, you are, needless to say, one of the, um, uh, as I said, one of the more prolific, active, um, uh, found, you know, players, I would say, in the sphere. Take the compliment. It's 2019. <laughs> Let's start just with Orbs. Okay. How's Orbs doing? Doing great. We've been in production since the end of March, and now we're all about getting usage. Uh, and I think this is a mission for the entire industry. Uh, mass adoption, getting customers to actually, you know, not just talk about blockchain, but actually run on it. <laughs> Entirely so, and mass adoption is, you know, I would argue still elusive. Um, very elusive. Very, very, very elusive. And blockchain, you know what, does blockchain need to enter the big institutions in order for people to trust it in a way? I mean, needless to say, it's some, uh, it's somewhat bad reputation given the connection to cryptos, what not. How do we get there? So basically, I like to split the world between two different big use cases. One of them is the financial one, you know, and there is mainstreaming of financial assets over blockchain. That's one use case. The second use case is applications. You know, the Web3, the internet, how do we deal with this? And I think the two are completely different and uh, I mean, the pathway towards mainstreaming them is very different. Uh, so I think we've done a long way, for example, with mainstreaming financial, uh, the financial side. Uh, Facebook Libra, I think is a good example. Uh, I'm going to stop you for a second. I want to ask you about Facebook Libra. Yeah. Needless to say, it mainstreamed the conversation. We could argue that it's not a cryptocurrency, but who cares? Um, you know, because it's being marketed as uh -huh. one. It has definitely mainstreamed the conversation. Is it good or bad for the sphere? Because at the end of the day, people will argue that Facebook is such a behemoth of an entity, and I say that in a good way, that it can also define future regulation or acceptance. Well, so Sorry. I think if you try to get mass adoption for a currency, let's not say cryptocurrency, but a new currency. A digital currency. Uh, a digital currency, then you need to think what are the challenges. And I think people thought that the challenge would be technological, and I think this is incorrect. The challenge is regulatory. That's it. And I think the way to get to face regulatory challenges and to deal with regulatory innovation is through companies like Facebook with solutions that are not completely decentralized. So I think the way to move towards mainstreaming the financial side is through permissioned networks, which I hate, uh, by the way. <laughs> exactly. As a person coming from the technology. Uh, and this brings us to the other side non-financial use cases, you know, the Web3 vision. What happened to that? Where are we on the path towards mainstreaming What happened this? to that? So here Your we theory have, on it. Yeah, okay. a very big dis dis disillusionment, I think, on the Web3, on the DAO model, the business model. I think, you know, people thought, okay, we have Ubers out there, let's create decentralized Ubers, let's create decentralized Googles, let's create decentralized Yelps, decentralize everything. And I think that we saw that they don't work. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think the to failure... To say the least. Yeah, yeah, the failure was not an infrastructure failure. What was it? A business model failure. Uh, it's very hard to create a product like Uber with a decentralized ecosystem. Uh, I think the token economies proved that they're very difficult to craft. Uh, if you look which token ecosystems the world has cre successfully created so far, we only see two use cases. Just go to the top 200, see which use cases do you see in there that survive to this day, you see two. Cryptocurrencies, that, that's one, like Bitcoin. Right. And the second is blockchain infrastructures, like EOS or Tezos or Cosmos right. or even ours. Uh, so we can create decentralized infrastructures. That's good. But decentralized apps running on top of that infrastructure, that's a whole different story. They don't work. Uh, and I think they would take 50 years. I was about to say, do you think we'll get there? 50 years? 50 years. Yes, because it's not changing you know, technology. It's changing the way businesses work. And if you want to create a decentralized Uber that will be able to compete with Uber Inc., that's going to be insane. Like Uber has 30,000 employees and it's managed centralized. The CEO tells everybody what to do. That's efficient. And to say the least, yeah, in So the, if you want to fight that, you need to be more efficient than that. And decentralization is inefficient. It gives a lot of benefit in terms of trust, right. but it doesn't compete well business-wise. Ah, so this brings the whole question, like what was 
with the Web3 vision. Who are the customers that are supposed to run on the blockchain infrastructure? Who are the customers? Do you think it's a generational thing? Are we 50 years away because we're just not ready? Uh, I think to prove that the business model of the DAO works, it will take 50 years. But I do think that the customer base exists today. And the customer base, in my eyes, is Uber itself. And this is, I think, the mind-blowing realization that I've had from Crypto Winter. The okay, break this down for me. Yeah, okay, the this companies is who right. will use blockchain technology are going to be the middlemen that we try to cut out in the ICO festivities of 2016. The, these are the customers. Uh, and the reason for that is, you know, the, these market leaders, they have a problem with trust. And we see that all around. And to solve this tr uh, problem of trust, you can go about it in two ways. One option is to cut them out, right. create new ones instead. But nobody's going to create a new Google that will compete with Google. It's too ambitious. The other thing that you can do is you can go to them and tell them you have a problem with trust, you want to improve yourself in trust, and I'm going to give you the tools of how to do that. But then you need to sell them on the technology. Yes, but once the technology is not undermining them, if the pitch is not decentralization, the pitch is much easier. And if the pitch is not decentralization, then let me ask you this. What's the point of the whole idea? Wasn't well, this the dream? And I think people need to give, I mean, decentralization to me is a pipe dream at this point. Yes, but decentralization is not a goal. It's a means to an end. Okay. Decentralization was supposed to give us trust. I think trust is the underlying problem that blockchain is trying to solve. Take a look at Bitcoin. Like, why do people are so fascinated with Bitcoin? What is the value proposition? And I think the value proposition is a guarantee of the monetary policy. Right. Because, for example, you know, let's take a look at the supply. You know, 21 million Bitcoins out there. If I go to a regular currency, nobody can guarantee that. Like, they would change it in a heartbeat. If, if they it feel like printing money. Exactly. Yeah. So there is a use case where somebody can just make this very strong guarantee that even the operators of the network, that they're very incentivized to add more coins out there, the miners, they want to stop the halvings, and they can do that. Right. So in order to create technologies that add accountability, I think that's a brand new concept in the world. Nobody's accountable for anything. I, you took the words out of my mouth. Can we please put accountability into the conversation in every sphere? So, right. so don't Facebook and Ubers of the world need accountability as well? Of course. <laughs> and the way to add accountability to them is not to replace them. Let Has them add Uber done damage to the emerging sphere? I'm wondering with what happened with Uber and the reputation. I think Uber showed us that you know these companies need accountability to do better because they strive upon the work of people in their ecosystems. For example, Uber relies on the drivers. Yeah. And the drivers are unhappy. Yeah. They're a captive audience, but this cannot stay for long. Like, at the end of the day, captive audiences move. So the only way Uber can survive is by showing this captive audience that their ecosystem is the best. And they would have no way of doing that without you know, establishing some sort of a little bit more trust with the drivers. Transparency. A little bit more transparency, exactly. And, and, and trust is an elusive thing. It turns out that you can't solve trust. You know, the only, you can't vouch for yourself. You can't say just, trust me, I promise you I'm going to do better from now on. <laughs> That's worthless. Yeah, no. The yeah. only way is to get somebody else to vouch for you. you. Look, the idea behind blockchain, needless to say, should be the future. We're sitting here in the Ethereal Summit in Tel Aviv, Israel. Um, elections are two days away. Do you see a future where government also sits on the blockchain? Yes, but once again, baby steps. I think people who pitch, let's do e-elections on the blockchain, are living in an illusion world. Like, this is not going to happen for 30 years. People are not ready for this big of a change. So if you want to change the world, think about how you can change the world slowly. Right. You can't disrupt too much at once. So I'm going to give you an example how I can fix elections and add accountability tomorrow in a way that's going to actually work. You heard it here first. Yeah. Shoot, please. Okay. Because there's also the 2020 elections. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. So this is the pitch. <laughs> You're going to go to a party, to a political party. And political parties are now in, in, they have a huge problem. Why? Because it's very difficult to compete right now. Nobody competes on what they're going to do. Nobody listens to what they're going to do. It's a popularity contest. The representatives are, I, I don't want to say super attractive. Myself as a voter, I don't know who to vote to. It's the selfie generation. It's not the ideology. It's not the platform. Exactly. It's, yeah. And the reason it has become this way is because there is zero accountability. I know that it doesn't matter as a voter who I vote to because anyways, they're not going to do what they promised me. 
So what they need to do in order to get my vote is to add just a little bit of accountability to what they say. So this is the way it could work. Imagine that you go to one of the parties and you tell them, I'm going to give you a pitch that will attract the younger generation to vote for you. You're going to create a mobile app. And in this mobile app, you're going to, before you vote on a topic in the government, you're going to ask your base what you should do. A referendum? Not really a referendum, but a poll. Okay. And this is not man, like it is not liquid democracy. Right. You're not a bot that is going to vote according to the populace because this doesn't work. The populace doesn't understand. They don't go to the government meetings. They don't know the details. But they do have an opinion and you represent them. So just ask them what they want to do. Do something else. But at the end of the four years or at the end of the year, you could see what you could show, what you asked, what they wanted you to do, and what you did differently. And then you could show, you know, the delta. One party would have a 50% delta, one party would have the 30% delta. I'm going to vote to the party that has the 30% delta because they're a closer representative to what I want. If I had to, you know, think, will there be a party that has 0% delta? No, because I'm not in the government meetings. The populace doesn't understand what needs to be done. Right. But there needs to be some accountability. So we're not running the elections on top of blockchain. That's not going to happen anytime soon. But we are going to be accountable to see what our base does. And we're not going to be able to fudge the numbers. Because if I were running it on my own centralized infrastructure, I would just, like, these numbers would be meaningless. Tal Orbs, the um, uh, co-founder, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> Tal Orbs, the, the co-founder of Orbs, you just blew my mind because I'm thinking, why aren't we doing this right now? I know the answer to that. Uh, I think it doesn't... I think the elections are in two days. That's why. <laughs> if it were in six months, we would be doing that. <laughs> um, Tal, I cannot thank you enough um, uh, for being with us today. As we said, Ethereal Summit in Tel Aviv, um, uh, the man behind the idea that is Orbs so necessary in this sphere. We are Block TV. We'll be right back. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.